Hey guys, welcome to a really fun and exciting episode of TFL's Talking Cars because today we're going to be talking about all things Kia and all things electric, uh, which is near and dear to my heart. And with me is uh, Stephen, Steve Kozowski. Um, and Steve, I'll have you say your title. It's a long one. The Manager of Long Range Strategy and Planning. Um, which I guess translates to the guy who does the EVs in, in America for Kia. Is that right? More or less. Okay. All right. So uh, let's talk about electric vehicles because we just had the Nero in our office uh, for three months. Um, and I got to tell you, I had so much fun with that car, uh, especially uh, since it's so torquey. Um, you know, doing a front wheel uh, drive burnout <laughs> is not something I expected to be doing. But was there, was there actually any planning or strategy behind putting that much torque to the front wheels when you were developing the vehicle? Well, uh, you know, I, I had a chance to drive the car uh, and the first time we drove the car and toggled through uh, eco mode and normal and sport and so forth, we were blown away at how strong it was. And uh, that's testament to uh, the, the torque and the linearity and the, uh, the potential and the fun to drive the fun to driveness of uh, EVs. So, um, you know, it's, it's a really cool aspect of EVs. And I think it's, it's also um, uh, an element that's going into the marketing and the positioning and the presentation of the cars in the market, uh, that they are in fact quite fun to drive. But, you know, uh, early on in the development of the Neuro and the Neuro EV, um, the, the target customers and the fit into the market, um, was was really set up around uh, maximizing the utility of the car because it's got a great package. You know, it's got a long wheelbase. Um, it's got a sizable functional uh, utility aspect to it. And and the approach with the Neuro EV was it happens to be electric, just like the regular Neuro happens to be hybrid. But the uh, pleasant byproduct of the um, the torque that's available in the motor, 291 pound feet. Uh, in a car that that weighs with 3,800 pounds, it's pretty remarkable. It's a it's a really fun to drive proposition. It's a it's a pleasant surprise. Yeah, and you know it's got all the um, key NS I'm gonna go with uh, that you'd expect out of a Kia, right? So uh, there is just a really easy to operate um, instrument cluster, uh, and you get a lot of um, you get a lot of um, value for your money. I always look at Kia as a brand where. You know, you guys are, are putting heated seats in places that uh, premium cars have heated seats and not, uh, you know, most cars. So, you know, I'm mm -hmm. always like, like pleasantly surprised when I see a heated seat in the back on a Kia as opposed to just a front. Is this a strategy yeah, on the part you. of the company or is this something that, 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 uh, uh, that you guys think long and hard about? Uh, we do think long and hard about it, and uh, there's a lot of uh, passionate discussion about the contenting and the strategy and the approach to uh, features and so forth, um, and trying to understand, you know, what the customers prioritize and value. Uh, that's always, it, it's always a very careful balance between uh, what's uh, required to be competitive on a certain grade versus, you know, for example, a Toyota Prius or a Honda Accord or something like that. Uh, versus what our customers value. And, you know, to be frank, there's a lot of moving parts that go into that because, um, y you know, we we've had a lot of success in packing the cars with a lot of content and value, and we want to continue that. So uh, we do look very carefully and strategically. Um, and, you know, like a perfect example is, um, is the heated seats, heated and cooled seats or uh, leather or, um, uh, the, the audio and navigation and so on and so forth. So we're very uh, considerate of our customers' wants and needs and the price points and, and maintaining a certain value proposition as you start from the LX and go to the EX and the touring and so forth. Yeah, so let me ask you, you know, your title is long-term planner. Um, right now, I, I think the statistic is that something like one, maybe 2% of all cars in America are electric. Um, where do you see that going? Is, is the future in Kia's mind electric? And if so, how are you going to address that? Because right now you have a smattering of electric cars, but um, if, if indeed the future is electric, wh where, where are you guys going with it? Or is it electric? Well, yeah, so I, I think 
I think it's fair to say that the, the future is electric. Um, and for a variety of reasons, one is, uh, from, at least from the standpoint of Kia, you know, we have a $25 billion uh, plan that was announced in February called Plan S, uh, and that's to invest in significantly into uh, multiple EVs for, for markets around the world. So uh, in, in terms of Kia, uh, there's no question that the future is electrified. As we, uh, you know, 10 years from now, if we're having this conversation, Roman, we're going to be looking at, uh, you know, 11 EVs uh, or more uh, around the world and, and a significant number of EVs and PHEVs in, in the United States market uh, for a variety of reasons. One is um, uh, it in, in some sense, uh, the the automakers um, are are uh, uh, seeing the uh, the need in the market for electrified propulsion. Um, you know, it's 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 actually cheaper to operate or lower cost to operate in many instances, uh, but also to um, help reduce uh, CO2 emissions globally. So. Therefore, it's incumbent upon the car companies to uh, produce vehicles that emit less CO2. Uh, but there's also, in the context of Kia, uh, a big shift in the brand direction. Uh, again, longer term, um, to be more electrified, to be more, I guess, we call it techie, uh, to offer new mobility solutions. Uh, so, so there's sort of a, a very broad, uh, scope on where the brand is going, uh, and the centerpiece of that is electrified propulsion. I, I do think in the marketplace, um, if you just look at the investment that's in place from from pretty much every manufacturer around the world, uh, there's no question that electric cars um, are are the next big thing. And you know, in the market right now, it's uh, it's about 1.3 percent are EVs, all in between PHEVs and EVs. It's about two percent, as you noted. Uh, th this has potential to go significantly higher, uh, you know, anywhere from uh, 6 to 10 percent or more. It depends on a lot of moving parts. Um, but if you just look at the, um, the forward investment by the top three or four manufacturers uh, participating in the United States or around the world, uh, there's no question that, uh, and again, including Kia, that uh, EV CEVs, are the next big thing. And uh, we will be a, a significant part of it. And they make a lot of sense for the US market because US consumers like crossovers, higher hit point, better visibility, lots of functionality. Uh, and, and from a, a packaging point of view, you can fit the battery underneath. Uh, it enables all wheel drive. So, uh, you know, I think also, if you kind of look at the US market and EVs, maybe globally, and you think about uh, EV 1.0 and EV 2.0 and EV 3.0, and those are various phases of where we are um, headed out to, say, 2030. I think we're about EV 2.0. And uh, there's a handful of cars that are built on dedicated EV platforms. And again, looking at uh, the forward investment and these new platforms and what it means to the marketplace, we we are entering a, a revolutionary period, uh, probably in the next three or four years, where the uh, the products that are coming again from Kia and uh, the industry as a whole are just going to blow your mind. And I think it means that uh, the 1.3 or 1.5 percent adoption of EVs, which is sort of on the fringe. Uh, is going to move massively as as the products are engineered and evolved much more closely to the U.S. consumers' tastes. And again, the technology is incredible. Uh, thinking about energy density of batteries, motor design, motor efficiency. I mean, if if you're enjoying if you're enjoying 291 pound feet in the narrow EV. And thinking about what's over the horizon a little bit, it, you're going to be grinning from ear to ear you know, constantly. It's going to be really amazing. Yeah, and, you know, uh, if I look at this from an automotive journalist standpoint, you know, manufacturers are always looking for white space, right? Someplace where there's nobody else in. And, and you know, with an ICE car, 
there isn't a lot of white space, right? You really have to go uh, into some kind of uh, deep weeds to, to figure out where uh, a segment exists that no one else is at. But in the EV mm -hmm. world, man, there is all kinds of white space, right? Everything from right now, the pickup truck, all the way to the sports car. These two things, as, yep. far, as far as I know, don't exist. And when I say don't exist, there's plans and companies are building them. But you, when I say exist, you can't go out and buy them. Um, and yet, for some reason, many of the manufacturers have concentrated on, like, economy cars, right? Uh, and I, I always mm -hmm. kind of scratch my head because I'm like, why don't you, you know, why don't you go to where the buyers are at? Like you said, the crossovers, um, the, the more popular vehicles, uh, you know, all wheel drive is so easy in an electric car compared to even a mm -hmm. traditional car. And yet many of the cars that are out there are front wheel drive, which is also weird because, you know, the reason the car started out front wheel drive was because it was a spacing and kind of a, mm -hmm. a vehicle packaging constraint. Right. And with an electric mm -hmm. motor, you don't have that anymore. You can have a front. Um, so where is, e where is Kia going next? You know, what's, what's the next segment that we're going to see something that, that, that actually is more kind of in that, in that sweet zone where, where people are at right now, where your customers are at. Yeah. So, uh, I think the the next couple of things that are over the horizon for us, um, if, 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 uh, in the plan S discussion, uh, in February, there was mention of our first dedicated EV. Uh, which I think will be revealed and revealed in 2020. It'll be on sale in the United States uh, uh, after that in 2021. But that first vehicle will be a uh, dramatic statement for Kia. Uh, it'll show the flexibility of a dedicated architecture, uh, and it will blur the lines between uh, crossover car uh, forms. And I think it'll be, um, I know it'll be a breakthrough uh, execution in terms of uh, the aesthetic and proportions and design and surface surfacing and technology. So for us, uh, uh, I, I think, you know, talking about the white space that's available, um, I think the, the EV architecture, uh, the platform uh, capability really lends itself to you know, this is a cliche, but out of the box thinking. And as you apply EV technology, the battery, the motors and all that to various um, parts of the market, it's it's remarkable what design and engineering can do uh, to change the aesthetic. And again, uh, the first dedicated EV that's coming from Kia will reflect this uh, newfound flexibility uh, backed up again with with uh, remarkable performance, 300 miles of all-electric range, uh, a suite of uh, uh, desirable functional uh, technologies uh, that, that you'll really like. So, but in the market space, um, if you think about this, um, you know, a, a lot of the automakers around the world, they first approached uh, EVs. I think the logic was that, look, we got to make uh, EVs that will work in Europe and Asia and the United States. So we're going to start with B and C segment cars, small cars, uh, and see how they work and learn and develop. Uh, and then they've been slowly scaling up a little bit. And um, uh, as that's what I'm saying. Like By the time we reach EV 3.0, which is maybe 12, 18 months from now, you're going to have uh, electric uh, powertrains applied to a variety of new, um, uh, different, uh, larger categories. And we're seeing this, for example, again, with CUVs, but also trucks. I mean, you look at the, what is it, six or seven different electric pickup trucks that are coming. So, um, and, and it, it'll, it enables uh, dramatic changes in proportions and aesthetic and, and capability. Uh, and, and, and two, um, a little further, think about, um, you know, MPVs, vans, uh, dedicated architecture. You know, um, the company has invested in a, a couple different uh, 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 MPV companies. Uh, Arrival is one, Canoe is another. And those are companies that are revealing that with uh, battery architecture and motor packaging and so forth, um, you can offer a dramatically different uh, aesthetic and function with an MPV. But getting back to, to uh, what we're working on, uh, I think that uh, as we go forward, you're going to see uh, dramatic new offerings in terms of uh, uh, blending, at least for Kia, uh, car and crossover uh, on our first dedicated EV and then 
some uh, some pretty uh, desirable surprises a couple years out. Uh, we do um, what I call what we call the world's toughest electric car test, called the Loveland Trials, and we we actually took the Nero up it. We drive a, a electric vehicle from our offices here in Boulder up to the Loveland Pass, which is about 75 miles straight up a mountain, uh, and we you know we see how it does using power going up a mountain, and then we see how it regens. And we just ran the new um, Mini uh, EV up that, and um, that only has a range of about 110 miles officially. And so we had to actually mm -hmm. recharge it um, on the way back. We wouldn't have made it uh, because it would be 150 miles round trip if you could you know, do it, but the car can't. Mm -hmm. And what we ran into mm -hmm. was uh, we went to uh, Electrify America uh, station, mm -hmm. and they had eight chargers, and three of them were broken. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And then the next door is, of course, the Tesla superchargers. I think there's 12 and they all work. Uh, and so, mm -hmm. so, you know, the immediate thought I had was when manufacturers are building these cars, are they also giving some thought to building out their own charging infrastructure? Because if you're, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're kind of counting on partners to do that, then you may end up in a situation where, like we did, you know, where three out of the eight chargers aren't working. And I'm not, I'm not. I don't know what happened. You know, we're talking with Electrify America to try to figure it out. But has there been any thought given by Kia to actually create its own charging network? Well, uh, you bring up a really, really important point, and that's infrastructure and charging. And uh, a couple of things. What we what we discover with uh, what we discovered with the first generation Soul EV and the second, uh, well, the Nero EV is that about eighty to ninety percent of charging uh, is done at home and work. In fact, it might even be a little higher than that in some instances uh, for a variety of reasons. And that primarily is reliability, right? I know I can charge at home and I know I can charge at work. Uh, the public infrastructure is definitely improving. It's changing. It's evolving. Electrify America is, uh, is, is pouring literally billions into it. And the other entities like EVgo, ChargePoint, they're also working diligently. So, um, but I think that, uh, you know, the automakers are looking at um, looking at this, trying trying to do their best uh, in terms of of, of uh, engineering the cars to you know for example to have a DC fast charging, and also uh, you you do see a lot of alliances and partnerships within the industry with other charging entities. You know for example um, uh, partnering with Electrify America or partnering with EVgo that kind of thing, but you know, uh, EV infrastructure, uh, as you know, Roman, is just really expensive, and it's uh, resource intensive in terms of uh, managing uh, the uptime and managing the maintenance and, and so forth. So, um, I think for 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 most automakers, uh, they are focusing on the product and their engineering resources that go into. Uh, the battery tech and the motor tech and, and creating the cars. But what what is clear to me, though, uh, and probably clear to the industry, I have to say, is that uh, any significant EV proposition um, requires an infrastructure solution. And, uh, you know, for example, early on when Kia went to market, we uh, we developed partnerships with uh, Bosch and AeroVironment and Leviton to uh, you know, vet uh, level two uh, home chargers out to make sure that look, you can get this one, this one, and this one. We've tested them; they work. Um, th that that's just one first step. But I do think that the uh, uh, the higher volume requirements and the uh, much more significant uh, sales and marketing efforts by the automakers, ourselves included. Uh, we'll need a deeper partnership with the uh, uh, infrastructure providers and, and charging system providers. Uh, but uh, I don't have anything at the moment to uh, uh, to offer in terms of what we would do. Yeah. All right. Um, the other, you know, the other, um, I think, big thing with uh, electric cars, and I'll give you an example. Is I was reading a study recently, uh, and uh, it asked people, like, you know, you know that. Uh, if you have a plug-in hybrid, you never actually have to plug it in. And most people did not understand that, right? <laughs> they thought that a plug-in hybrid was the same as an electric car. Uh, and so, you know, the hardest thing I found in my life to do was to sell something where you also have to educate the consumer what the value of that is, right? Uh, and I think, you mm -hmm. know, when you get to that, um, that point where it goes from 1% to like 10%, 
you're going to have to do mm -hmm. a, a really good job in educating people so that they actually know the difference between a plug-in hybrid versus a pure EV. How is Kia going to uh, meet that challenge? That's a big challenge, Roman. Um, I, I see it and feel it regularly. You know, I go to the auto shows and I talk to customers. I go to the EV ride and drives and I talk to customers. And uh, we're, we're asked uh, regularly about, uh, you know, the, the EV side of the uh, proposition is, is, is pretty clear now, like, oh, I have to plug it in at home or I can charge at work. Okay, I get that. But uh, I also get the question about, well, wait a minute, it has a plug. Do I, I have to put, wait, I have to put gasoline. Yeah, I have to put gasoline in it. And, and but wait, I can char I plug in at home too. Yeah, you can plug in at home. And, you know, they kind of scratch their head a little bit. And so um, there is that confusion. And, uh, you know, these, these cars have been on the market for 10 years now. Uh, so, you know, it's incumbent upon the manufacturers to uh, train the dealers uh, and to have uh, you know pretty simple marketing messages on the websites uh, in in, in uh, product information to simply explain about how this works. Uh, but you know, um, one of the things that that's cool about uh, electrified propulsion is that there is a pretty close knit uh, community uh, of of customers and, and on the forums and so forth. So. Uh, and, and the other part of it too is that we are starting to see a lot of these customers come back into market. So, you know, if you had a PHEV, um, you, you might be buying another one or shifting over to EV. So you're you're kind of familiar with it. But it is the newcomers that uh, uh, where we have some work to do with respect to um, the materials, the training materials for dealers, and uh, also the uh, uh, in, information for uh, newcomers. Yeah, I think you just put your finger on it. You know, uh, it's funny. I, I did a show maybe a year and a half ago with the, with the local uh, uh, head of like the dealers association, and you know, and, and I was talking about what dealers think of electric cars, and he was like, "Oh, we love electric cars; it's the future." And then when you get them offline, it's you know, he, dealers hate electric cars for obvious reasons, right? They don't require a lot of maintenance. You don't need to bring them in, uh, and a lot of modern dealerships revenue now comes from service uh, and electric cars don't need any fluids they don't need any you know changing of of filters it's it's pretty much you know it's pretty much just plug it in and use it so so what has your strategy been to kind of um talk to your dealers about the fact that this is coming and that they shouldn't fear it uh, but they should embrace it or maybe they don't want to embrace it i don't know what, what are you hearing from those guys well um it, it's it's kind of mixed, Roman. Um, what we've seen, uh, again, we've only been in the business really about three or four years. Um, and the rollout, uh, uh, it really, our, our EV launch started in California and then it went up the coast to Oregon and Washington and then made its way to the East regions um, or East region. So, uh, but what we've seen is that uh, there's there's some dealers who, really get behind and focus on it. And uh, they're able to make a business out of it, which is to say that the volume is sufficient uh, and they're, they're able to do quite well. Uh, of course, as you mentioned, uh, you know, service and parts are a, a, a pillar of a dealer's um, revenue and profit. So uh, that is a consideration. But, um, you know, I think what we've done in, in, in many markets is uh, we, we have dealers, big dealers who uh, are able to sell uh, pretty significant volumes of EVs. But, you know, at the same time, they have a, a robust uh, parts and service business, um, you know, built on cars like the Soul and the Optima and the Sorento and, of course, now the Telluride. So uh, there's, there's not so much of a threat uh, because the business is there. But that is a legitimate concern and you can you can look at the NADA and you can uh, look across the industry and you can see some dealers who are uh, 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 talking about this it's it yeah you know I was uh, it's funny I was talking with one of the uh, Hyundai designers kind of a sister company Chris I can't think of his last mm -hmm. name now and he was telling Chapman. me, you know, he's, yeah, he's got him. He used to work at BMW. He's telling me that one of the, one of the things that, that really sets Kia and Hyundai apart is that you guys work twice as hard. You're kind of the new kids on the block <laughs> and you feel like you really have to prove yourselves. So you're out there uh, really pushing hard 
to, you know, like if you're BMW, you've got this legacy of building cars or Mercedes, right? The very first car, whereas Kia uh, is a new company, you know, in relative terms. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a little bit of a chip on your shoulder. So, so um, do you think that helps uh, in terms of embracing electrified cars versus having this long legacy, you know, that goes back to the very first diesel, if you're a Mercedes, you know what I mean? Does, does, does mm -hmm. that, is, is that kind of a more, um, is, it, is it easier to embrace uh, the disruption that electric cars are bringing to the business? Yes. I think the short answer is yes. And, you know, the, the attitude and the posture in this company um, has been a little bit edgy. And uh, there is a, a, uh, a point of view or perspective amongst our, our leadership and, and, uh, and, and uh, the employees to take some chances, take some risks, uh, see how things work. And, and you can see it in some of our cars, like the original Soul and the 2011 Optima. Um, you know, we, we've taken some chances. And uh, I, I also think that uh, uh, as a brand, uh, we we have the latitude to take some risks and take some chances. So uh, it's in some sense part of our DNA. Uh, and it's also in some sense uh, expected in a marketplace from Kia. Um, so I think uh, actually that puts us in uh, a nice position uh, relative to uh, what EV uh, technology, the platform, and everything else allows the cars to be, uh, which again fits with uh, a little bit of the edginess of the Kia brand. So I, I think that's a, a really cool point uh, that you bring up, Roman. Yeah, and you know, I mean, sometimes as a journalist, it's easy for me to uh, to, to come up with these ideas because you know, there's not a lot of not a lot at stake here. But like, I would love, you know, the Telluride is probably one of my favorite cars. Uh, of the last year, um, just just nailed it out of the ballpark, right? Uh, every so often, a car comes along that that has it all, right? The styling, the value, the performance, the fuel economy, uh, the size. You know, I'm just going down the list of everything that works on the Telluride. And, and wouldn't it be cool if you you know put two electric motors in it and a battery pack? And I, I got I gotta say, I've been watching like a lot of shows where they're going back and electrifying like classic cars you know on tv and it yeah. doesn't seem yep. that hard it, i mean it seems like a, a, a in trail combustion engine is much harder to engineer and especially when you're pushing the envelope with like direct injection or doing some of the stuff that, mm -hmm. that you guys are doing i mean you know sticking two electric motors and a bunch of batteries into an existing platform doesn't seem like it would be that difficult and i would love to see like an electric telluride uh, go up against the Tesla Model Y, you know, and, and you'd have a vehicle that um, that is, I think, in a lot of ways built better because, uh, you know, you guys know how to build cars and you've been doing it longer. So the quality is there. I'm not trying to just jump on Tesla, but we have a Model X right now. And, you know, it, the gaps and the panels don't line up, you know, for what the standard yeah. is. So, it, it, you know, yeah. you said, there, you know, 10 years from now, there's going to be what you said, 12 cars that are electrified by Kia. Um, is, is that one of the kinds of cars that we'll be seeing? Something that's, you know, maybe all-wheel drive, that is uh, a family-based crossover, you know, that, that is like right in the heart of where the, the segment is right now, where people are shopping. So, uh, I, I agree with you 100%. And I think it is um, remarkable what the batteries and motors do for the car in terms of fun to drive, linearity, quiet. It's just a remarkable experience. And you get gobs and gobs of torque, which is great for towing. Um, the package space, for example, in a utility vehicle can be huge when the, the, the shadow of the vehicle on the outside is, is not quite as huge. So there's so, so many uh, strengths to doing with what you're describing. And, um, you know, I can tell you, Roman, that we we see the opportunity that you do uh, with respect to um, uh, like a battery electric Telluride. Um, it, it's not something we can really uh, talk about or disclose at the moment, but I think, um, you know, as we, as we talk about the evolution of uh, this part of the industry um, it, and, and what the U.S. consumers want, and I mean, look, there's what 1.7 million units of uh, midsize SUVs that were sold last year. That's a huge market. And uh, when you talk to consumers about this, and you lay out what you described, which is, you know, a three-row midsize EV SUV with 475 pound-feet, charge it at home, 
you know, zero to 60 in six seconds or lower and so on and so forth. Uh, there's a lot of people who are quite interested in that. And uh, uh, so I think um, uh, what you're describing is, uh, is, is, uh, is a very interesting concept. It aligns nicely with the U.S. market. Um, you know, it, it sounds simplistically, well, why don't you just take the, you know, the floor pan out of a Telluride and put a, you know, 90 kilowatt hour battery in a motor in front and motor in so back. But, uh, of course, it's, it, it is much more complicated and complex uh, from a variety of reasons, you know, that relate to manufacturing and crash and cost and, and uh, a lot of other aspects, as, as you know. Uh, but uh i i do i do think that um as these platforms evolve as the technology evolves as the costs come down everything you're describing um uh, can 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 kind of scale up and down the segments within the industry and if you, you talk about this formula you just um, mentioned think about applying that to other vehicles in the lineup and how cool that would be so um the sports car. You have a sports <laughs> car. You have a really cool sports car. Yeah, exactly. So uh, stay tuned, I guess, is the simple answer. Uh, and just know that uh, as we uh, implement and execute our plan S, uh, you know, getting to about 20% of our uh, sales volume by 2025 or 26 as EVs, that there's uh a lot of white space, a lot of clean sheet opportunities here, Roman, and um, that's about all I can say at the moment. Yeah, no, I want to take a step back because I can see the comments already. You know, a lot of people will say, well, it's only 1% of the market. You know, why, where, why do you think that uh, electric cars are the future? Uh, and it's not something that we're just pulling out of midair, right? I mean, you look at, um, I'll give you a couple, two examples, right? Uh, look at countries like Norway where now electric cars represent the majority of all cars sold. And I'm not saying that the, the Norway points the way to America, but when you have a country where now the majority of all cars sold are electric, uh, then that's a pretty big uh, kind of, you know, sign saying this way, this way. Or for me, you know, the moment where, where it kind of, the aha moment was where forever, I used to grow up, you know, loving cars and like the mid-sized um, performance luxury sedan that that was always the, the watermark was the bmw 3 series right that was growing mm -hmm. up reading car and driver that was always the one that won the shootouts mm -hmm. and, and when mm -hmm. the tesla model 3 worldwide outsold outsold the the bmw 3 series that's a pretty big you know sign pointing <laughs> electric cars yeah are, are coming right. and so so for all the people out there are, are thinking well you know it's been good enough for my dad and my grandfather why do i need it um i would say you know you probably haven't driven an electric car uh or um maybe you should go try driving an electric car because uh you know for, as, as, as a performance guy the the torque is um and what I mean by torque is acceleration, right? The torque is about acceleration, horsepower is about top speed, but the t torque is, that's why we started this conversation about just, you know, the front wheel uh, drive <laughs> burnout. Torque is exhilarating, right? You point and shoot. Um, it's, it's just a lot of fun. The other thing now, you know, we're doing this over Zoom because of the pandemic. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, with the world economy shutting down, it was really nice to have, like, clean air. I don't know, you know, how much nicer it was in California, but it was a lot nicer here. And when I get behind the wheel of our long-term Tesla or the Nero, uh, I always felt good because I know that I'm, I'm not polluting and pouring a lot of smoke and, and, and the other comment is going to be no you know you're just moving it downstream no the argument's been done guys it's 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 you know once upon a time when all of our energy production came from coal you probably were moving it downstream but now a lot of our energy production comes from renewables be it hydroelectric or solar or wind so 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 it is clean energy and then then of course the other argument is well the batteries are really dirty and and i'm like have you watched some of these shows i mean teslas are, are worth they're waiting gold because of the batteries, even after they're crashed, right? So people are naturally recycling them. There's this, and that's gonna happen with all, all brands, not just mm -hmm. Tesla, I'm just mm -hmm. using them as an example. Um, so mm -hmm. I just wanted to kind of bring that out there so people understand why we're talking about this, uh, that it's not just, you know, not just some like, like crazy, you know, pie in the sky. <laughs> This is this is this is something that only you know you, you guys in California and Colorado want, but here in Texas, you know, we're going to be driving our pickup trucks, um, and I'm like, yeah, and they're going to be hybrid and they're going to be electric, and it's going to be cool. Um, so, yep. so I'm glad the Kia is you know is 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 
kind of in the forefront of this. What are you most excited about? If, if you're looking down the road 10 years from now, what's, what, 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 what gets you the most excited? Well, uh, I think all of the above, which is the, uh, the incredible advancements in uh, electrification technology in terms of energy density, performance, lower cost, uh, the flexibility and freedom it gives uh, engineers and designers to make really, really cool, fast, fun um, uh, new products. That to me is, is super exciting. But uh, also, you know, there's a lot of other tech that's coming on the inside of the car uh, in terms of uh, augmented reality heads up display, over the air updates, uh, a lot of the connected car connectivity stuff that's coming is going to blow your mind. And uh, I think, you know, thinking about things like 5G uh, and and uh, all of this, there is this uh, sea change uh, that, that's happening in terms of automotive technology uh, across the board, whether it's electrification, uh, materials, mass reduction, internal combustion, it's, it's incredible. So, uh, you know, we have a, a really strong power, uh, it's really strong uh, lineup right now. Uh, but you know what what's what's coming is uh just something to behold and every year it just keeps getting better and better and better so um i i'm truly excited about the evs we have coming in the next 12 to 18 months uh what's over the horizon a little farther is um equally uh mind blowing and impressive and i think uh you know the the uh, the company in the industry uh, is is at a at a major inflection point, and uh, you know a, a lot of things. Roman um, it tied to COVID, the economy, society, uh, demography, technology, uh, and maybe for the next two or three or four years, there's going to be some churn. Um, but what's coming is, uh, is, is really incredible. And I think uh, that's what's exciting about Kia is as a brand, uh, we recognize this and we're able to um, devise products and strategies and, and offerings to our consumers that are, uh, are reflective of all that. They're going to be cool. They're going to be fast, fun, efficient, affordable, uh, desirable, um, and, and will really put a smile on your face. You really enjoy it. Yeah, what, what you know, speaking, uh, what do you guys see as the biggest uh, obstacle to adoption by, for electric vehicles? Do you see it as price, or do you see it as charge time, or do you see it as uh, range? I mean, or is it all of the above? You, know, you must do a lot of studying about that. What, what's, you know, mm -hmm. what are the obstacles that you, you see your buyers yeah. most stumbling upon? Yep, it, it's all of the above. Uh, definitely uh, cost and price. Uh, it's it's charging infrastructure and then range. Um, the, those are like the top three things, price, range, charging infrastructure. And like I said, the, um, the, some of the folks who've been in, been in EVs or PHEVs, uh, you know, maybe five or six or seven years ago who are now coming back, uh, they're, they're, it's, it's, it's super easy for them to, to move to a, a neuro EV. Um, but, it, there's a lot of other things that are that are attached to this. So, product-wise, the products are getting better and better and better. You know, 300 miles is a tipping point, as 200 miles was, and you know what's over the horizon from 350 and 400 and so forth will make it that much easier for EV adoption. But uh, it's infrastructure, uh, you know, which is getting better and better every day. And also, uh, from from our point of view as a distributor. Uh, it relates to uh, the marketing and the training and the distribution and so forth. So uh, those are sort of the, the top line uh, 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 bogeys or, or hurdles. Um, it's, uh, it's getting better. And uh, again, with, with the cost and price reductions in the future, we're, we're uh, optimistic. Yeah, and you know, as we as we get, go further down this road, obviously the tax incentives are drying up. Um, do you, do, you, um, do you, I mean, you still have all much of yours, right, as a brand? Uh, but mm -hmm. Tesla has burned through theirs. Um, 
how important is that? I mean, seven and a half thousand dollars as a federal is a lot. In Colorado, we were at five. Uh, this year, we went to four, and then goes to three. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's a lot of money on the table. Uh, how important are those federal incentives uh, in your business plan, or or local yeah, incentives? It's, both. Yeah, yeah both. Uh, it's very, very important, and and you bring up a really good point because. Um, we're Kia as a brand is advantaged because we have a significant number of 7,500 uh, tax credits available for us uh, for, for years to come, which is going to be helpful. Um, but there's no doubt that uh, until the cost comes down significantly to where the 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 cost and the price uh, are are uh, similar to that of an internal combustion car. And a lot of a lot of folks have thrown out you know hundred hundred dollars per kilowatt hour or maybe even less, uh, and that's definitely the the vector which is down and to the right. There's no question about that. But until we get there, um, there's state subsidies and the federal tax in, uh, incentive that uh, that can take uh, you know ten, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars off the the consumer's price, uh, and that makes the car uh, much more compelling. Uh, in, in, so I think to answer your question, they're very, very important. Uh, whenever there's something that comes up on the uh, legislative uh, front in terms of um, you know reductions of this or changes in that, uh, we are huge advocates. And you know it's notable. Yeah, you mentioned Colorado. Um, there's also other states like New Jersey, New York, and of course California. Uh, so there's there's a lot of um, uh, importance to the. Uh, the final price of the car that's tied directly to the local incentive, and, and we fully support it uh, all the way. Yeah, let me let me just kind of put some cars and numbers to what we're talking about, so people can kind of uh, visualize this. So the, I believe the Nero that we had for our long-term tester was forty-two thousand, maybe something like that. And in Colorado, uh, that car would have cost you about thirty, right? Because it would have been seven and a half federal, and then at that time we got a five thousand. Uh, local, so yeah. that's a thirty thousand dollar car, which is still, you know, a, a, a significant amount of money. Uh, now, you know, if we're looking at a different segment, that mini we just tested, um, the one that we had, I think, was thirty seven, but you, they started at twenty nine. So if you started a twenty nine thousand dollar car and then you take, you know, you take twelve thousand off of that, now you're talking about an eighteen thousand dollar car. Uh, at, at, at that point, um, it starts to make a lot of lot of sense for a lot of people, even though the range on that car was only 110 miles. But let's say you had an $18,000 car where the range was, like you said, at that tipping point, or at least a, a previous one, 200 miles, right? That becomes, that becomes I think, uh, a very attractive option for a lot of people. And, and let's face it, uh, most of the current crop of electric cars out there are expensive, right? They're, they're, yeah. they're, they're, not, they're certainly not affordable. And then when you have, you know, Tesla Model S's and Model X's that cost 87,000 or a performance 120,000, um, a Porsche Taycan, uh, you know, 126,000, Turbo S 186,000, it doesn't help doesn't help establish the electric car as the people's car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, that's a legitimate point. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so I'm, I'm hoping that you guys, some time. yeah, I'm hoping that you guys, you know, as a value brand will, will kind of, kind of shatter that uh, myth and, and actually, you know, you know, create a, an electric vehicle that, that a person can, um, buy uh, and afford because once you get them they're much less expensive to actually maintain and run um it That's depends right. of course you know how you charge you know, these are all like this, there's a lot to this equation right it depends how you charge mm -hmm. them where you charge them but like you said home charging especially at night is very affordable even with even mm -hmm. we, we just did a video today where we actually took the model x and we towed uh, against the lexus lx and it was still cheaper even at you know cheap gas which is as cheap as it ever gets right here in colorado well, we're paying a, about a dollar and ninety cents a gallon. I'm sure in California you can probably add a, a dollar to that, right? I'm guessing it's always mm -hmm. more expensive right. there. Yeah, yep. uh, but even even at these low prices, if you charge at home, then electric vehicles are still cheaper to to run, and I think they're still cheaper to to maintain, um, and they're still cheaper to 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 own in the long run. So there's a lot of pluses for electric vehicles. Um, Absolutely. Before we, before we run out of time, I promise 45 minutes, we're almost there. Um, what segment of car are you looking forward to the most? You know, so right now we've got 
a, a plethora of uh, sedans that are electric. I call them, you know, converted, converted economy cars, small crossovers. Uh, when the Cybertruck came out, everybody lost their, you know what? Um, <laughs> there, there are no sports cars except for the Roadster that's, that I know of. So, but what segment are you like the most excited about that hopefully Kia will be working on, will be coming down the road? Well, um, I think, you know, personally speaking, I have my own preferences, but in the context of my job and, and my employer and our business, I think uh, the next big thing that's, that's really important to us in the industry will be EV SUVs and all different sizes and flavors of them. I think the, um, uh, the attributes of electrification we're talking about here are going to fit so wonderfully with these cars. Uh, and again, developed on uh, all new dedicated EV platforms. Uh, the performance, the package, the tech, it's going to be incredible. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to, um, so the first thing is our, our dedicated EV that's coming, um, you know, more than a year away, but you'll see it sooner. That's going to be a really exciting car that will help reshape the Kia brand and, and uh, be a nice, nice, dramatic statement for us. And then after that, you know, you have to think about like the next generation Euro EV. I mean, if you, if you think the current car is good, uh, think about what's over the horizon with respect to that one. And then uh, a whole wave of new EV uh, vehicles from Kia. You know, we talked about uh, how many uh, new uh, EVs are, are planned uh, all the way to 2030. So, there's um, so many fantastic Kia products uh, that are coming. But for me, I think to answer your question, I think the uh, uh, slurry of EV SUVs that are coming uh, will be really, really cool. Yeah. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. I, I, like, I like fast cars to begin with. I owned an NSX for a couple of years, and, and I, I missed that car. Uh, and... Uh, uh, I, I love high-performance sports cars as much as the next guy, and muscle cars too. Don't get me wrong; there's nothing like a, you know, big block Chevy. But the um, uh, for the broader market and what really fits well with American consumers uh, will be the uh, the EV SUV in various different forms and flavors. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking forward to uh, the first sports car, the first truck, uh, the first uh, muscle car. Um, uh, because an electric muscle car is truly going to be astounding. <laughs> uh, yeah. But thank you very, yeah, thank it, you very much. Go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, you can see a little, a little taste of that with some of the stuff that's been like the COPO Camaro EV uh, right. and the Mustang EV and so forth. And 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 not to mention the Tesla Roadster and so forth. There's there's been some remarkable uh, little teasers, if you will, of of what's uh, what's coming. So sorry, sorry to interrupt you there. Uh, oh, no worries. I also owned an NSX, and then uh, I traded it in on my son, Tommy, so <laughs> when he was born. <laughs> <laughs> I, I traded mine for a house. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I do miss that car, but, but I, I'm excited to see that, that, that Kia is, you know, in the horse race. Uh, I can't wait to see the very first uh, car that comes out that's going to be uh, hopefully, you know, out very soon. Uh, and, yeah, can't wait to take it up to Loveland Trials when it actually... Uh, rolls off the assembly line. Uh, so guys, thank you very much for taking the time uh, and joining us and looking a little bit into the future of what Kia uh, is doing. Thank you, Steve, for uh, kind of, you know, pulling back the uh, um, curtain a little bit. Uh, usually with manufacturers, uh, I can't tell you how special this is because the typical comment we get is we don't talk about future products. So I'm very grateful that, that you did share a, a little bit of future product. And of course, that's because you've got all the other competitors looking at what you're going to be doing. Uh, and so wh why show them your cards? So I'm grateful that, that you did give us a peek of what's happening at Kia. Uh, and yeah, if you guys are um, um, interested, go to tflcar.com for more news views and of course, real world reviews. Thank you, Steve. Uh, uh, thank you, Shami. I know you're here. I really appreciate it. See you guys next time. Ciao.